exciting. Here we go. Thanks, Kasia. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks to the organizers in general for putting this together. It's been a great pleasure to, to start to go to conferences again. It makes a real difference. I felt like I had forgotten how this, how this feels, but uh, I went to one conference a couple of weeks ago and already there's such a big difference. I'm really looking forward to, to the interactions over the week. Um, so I have to apologize for, for the title of the talk and the state of affairs of what I'm going to talk about because it's, it's work in progress. And I think it's sufficiently interesting that uh, it's worth giving a talk about it, but it's also not yet at the point where, you know, that's like the big theorem. Um, so maybe this all goes nowhere, but uh, maybe it doesn't. So let me indulge for a couple of minutes um, in sharing some thoughts related to the topics of the workshop. Um, and maybe at some point at the end, you should ask me why is this called tropical field theory? Because I realized preparing the slides that actually I don't explain that. So. Um, so, so my starting point is because we're looking at very different aspects of uh, quantum field theory, um, I should declare I'm a perturbative person. So I'm looking at perturbation theory and I'm trying to understand physics from perturbation theory, which is very old fashioned, but um, still maybe uh, there's something to be learned there. So we all know the, the game. We have to sum over a couple of Feynman diagrams uh, to to understand what might happen in an interaction of particles. And well, we can do approximations computing a couple of those, but really what we should do is sum over all Feynman graphs. And at least on a formal level, this gives us um, a solution to the quantization problem of a given uh, classical theory. And what we do is we have this combinatorial counterpart where we talk about graphs. Um, so the things that I've drawn here, and then for every graph there's an integral, and these integrals that depend on physically relevant data. There's masses and momenta there, usually irregularized. So there's also some dependence on dimensions and maybe some extra regulator variables. Um, and then the, the ultimate goal in principle should be to compute more and more graphs and you should get a more and more precise um, result for your theoretical calculation. But the problem is that, well, there's many problems with this. I only want to, want to mention two of the many problems here. Um, one problem, uh, is that these integrals themselves are extremely complicated. Um, so this is an area I've been um, studying for a while and there's huge progress and many, many, many interesting things to be said there. But I'm not going to say anything about this aspect. So the, the main message I want to bring across is that these, these integrals are just very complicated. So we started out many years ago using polylogarithms to compute some of these integrals. Um, but then we realized polylogarithms are not enough. So there's all kinds of elliptic modular forms, K3 surface, higher dimensional Calabi-Yau manifolds and their periods. So there's like, I mean, in some sense, it gets as complicated as you, as you wish. Um, so this is a practical obstacle to compute these, these terms explicitly. The other problem is that even if you would be able by some magic machinery um, to compute these, uh, the problem is that this, uh, the sum of these terms is actually infinite, at least in the theories that I consider interesting, which are just um, borderline renormalizable theories. So um, where we have a factorial growth of the perturbation series. Uh, and in this case, um, you know that the series itself, if you sum it naively, would eventually diverge. And we have to do a lot of tricks um, to actually take these perturbative calculations that are so very hard to get by. And then we have to use Borel transformation and other resummation techniques and also that is an area where a lot of interesting activity is happening right now. And I subsume under the name of resurgence. So there's a lot of um, machinery and understanding of what you should do in principle if you have such a perturbative series and how you should put it together uh, to get some, some good result out of it. So in principle, it sounds like we have progress on all fronts. Uh, it should make us uh, very happy. But I, I would claim that at least from my point of view, uh, even though we have all of these uh, advances, the, the perturbation series and the, and the theories that physicists like to use to describe actual, the actual world uh, is still very poor. I mean, when you look at calculations in, in the standard model, I mean, most of the calculations are done one loop or two loop, uh, maybe three loop in very few cases, and maybe renormalization constants are calculated to a couple loop orders more. But from a pertur perturbation and resummation resurgence point of view, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, you cannot start uh, using resurgence if you only have two coefficients of a series. I mean, there's just, it's nonsense. 
So I'm, I'm happy that this message apparently comes across. It's so try to tell that to physicists who compute millions of high minute goals to get a one loop result. Okay, so um, what can we do? There's many things one can do. Um, one idea, well, basically one has to simplify to get some insight in what's going on. And then one idea one, uh, to simplify is to change the theory to, to, to a theory which is nicer and has better properties. And the most extreme things you could do is to get some integrable theory, um, which are marvelous, beautiful constructions full of insights. So for example, there are these classical integrable theories in two dimensions. Recently, there have been uh, other, other integral theories uh, in, in matrix models, in non-commutative space. And these are fascinating uh, situations where you're actually able to resum the entire series. So you can compute all the Feynman integrals and add them up all together and understand the resum thing. So this is like the, in, in that sense, the resummation problem in this case can be solved completely. The problem is though that the structure of the perturbation series in this model is completely different from what we would expect. Because in those theories, you usually have a convergent expand. So when you think of these integrable models, also when you think of planar n equals four, super young mills, these kind of things, you know, the integrals simplify at least to some degree. I mean, you can still get transcendental functions, but they are of some kind of bounded, maybe bounded, maybe not complexity. But the problem is for this resummation point of view, it's not telling you what's happening because you don't get this factorial divergence. So you cannot really study the resurgence in these models. Another thing you can do, and which has been done, is to use Dyson-Schwinger equations and use truncated Dyson-Schwinger equations in the actual theory. So you can take your phi to the fourth theory or your Yukawa theory or a QED or even supersymmetric theories uh, and study Dyson-Schwinger equations, which usually have infinitely many terms. But when you truncate them, you're looking at families of diagrams that are insertions of a certain type of diagram into each other. Um, and that's an infinite series of diagrams. And if you choose uh, proper diagrams, you can actually generate cases where you do get factorial growth. So this is really a case where you can probe the resurgence uh, structure and the asymptotic growth in this factorial regime. So from that point of view, this is, this is the right thing to do. Um, the only problem is that because you're truncating, right, you're only looking at this very special class of diagrams. And there's always this question remaining, well, maybe if you would include all diagrams, maybe it would look a bit different. We really don't know. It would be nice to have a model where you have the full asymptotic richness and the full structure of subdivergences and nestings. Um, and so what I'm trying to, to, to put to the test here is maybe what I call the tropical limit or tropical field theory. Now, this is a weird thing. It's not an integrable model in the usual sense, but it's integrable in the sense that you can compute the Feynman integral. So you can compute the perturbation series in principle to arbitrary order. It is very close to the actual perturbation series. Um, and so I think it's an interesting uh, toolbox to, to really probe this full uh, resurgent structure. This is like the, the ultimate hope for this. So I'm not going to um, give you the plots and results for, for these things. But I hope I made my, where, where I'm coming from, my point of view on this. I hope I made this clear. When should I finish? Um, so to, to explain what I mean by the tropical limit, um, I have to talk a little bit about what a Feynman integral is uh, in a particular representation. So you can write down your Feynman integrals in many different um, parameterizations. The one that's, for my, that's best uh, suited to understand this tropical limit is what's called the Schwinger or Feynman parameter representation. So if you have never seen that, there's a very quick introduction here. Um, so take a graph. And I'm looking at this, this graph on the bottom here, this complete graph on four vertices. You can also think of it as the wheel with three spokes, same thing. And I'm looking at spanning tree. So what is a spanning tree? A spanning tree is a subgraph that has all the vertices in it. They're all connected. So you can get from every vertex to every other within that subgraph, um, but it should be simply connected. So you shouldn't be able to, to run in a loop uh, in the subgraph. This is why the top three things are forbidden because they either don't connect all the vertices or they have different several connected components or the last one. I mean, it is connected, but it's not simply connected because it has a, has a loop. So if you look at the spanning trees of this graph, you find that actually of two types, 
So you can have uh, this type here, which is the star. Obviously, that's a spanning tree. There are four of those. Um, or you can take these paths. And if you count them, there's 12 of those. In total, you get 16 spanning trees, and they look like this. So for every graph, you can enumerate these spanning trees. And I should say, I mean, in using the spanning trees to understand the asymptotics of graphs is a very old uh, procedure. Um, and I'll come back to that. But what is the actual Feynman integral? Well, for this talk, I'm going to simplify matters and I'm going to talk about Feynman integrals without masses or momenta. So this is really just about renormalization group functions of zero scale integrals, but you can generalize everything I'm going to say also for kinematics. But just for simplicity, in this case, you only look at these spanning trees and then you sum over all the spanning trees and you take the product of a variable X that is associated to every edge that is not in the tree. So in this example, if you have two vertices and two edges, then I mean one spanning tree is if you only take the edge two, and then you're missing the first one. This is this term X1. And if you take the spanning tree, which is just the top edge X1, uh, then you're missing the edge two, so you get the X2, right? So for this graph, this polynomial U, which is called the graph polynomial, is just the sum of the variables. That's for every one loop graph, you will get such a linear case. And then the integral that you want to compute is, uh, in this case, in four dimensions for these graphs, it's one over u squared and you integrate all the x's except for one. So I, I can choose one of the x's, the, the first one, say I put it to one, and then I integrate over the other. In this case, you get this very simple integral, which is just one. But this is the, the one that gives you the, the one loop order contribution to the beta function and phi to the fourth theory. Um, but as I said, so these are the things that contribute to the beta function, the normalization constants. Um, so they enter running coupling and critical exponents. Um, so for critical exponents, you're using universality to use uh, phi to the fourth theory to end resummation uh, to understand um, phase transitions. And what I wanted to, to point out here is that these things are very hard to compute. Uh, maybe it, it's, it's, very, it's not so easy to understand how difficult they are if you haven't tried. Um, I'm just giving you one example. So the thing that I showed you earlier, where you have these 16 spanning trees, uh, so you will have a sum of 16 terms. Every spanning tree has three edges, so you're missing three edges. So there's like a cubic polynomial uh, with 16 terms, and you have to integrate one over the square of that. Um, and the, re and, and the way you can see that it's difficult is because the result is a bit surprising, maybe. So what you get out is, uh, is the value of the Riemann zeta function, the sum of the inverse cubes. And this is just the very simplest case. And in general, these things get much, much more involved as generalizations of these functions. And I really don't want to go into details. I just want to explain that uh, this is what the integral looks like. So you have this polynomial, you integrate one over the polynomial squared, and we get transcendental functions in most cases. And another sign that, that, that illustrates how difficult it is is that, for example, in fact, with the four theory, which you should think of, you know, it's, it's no supersymmetry, it's just a single scalar particle. Uh, so there's no tricks or anything, it's just these bare integrals. And there's only a single family of uh, infant family of integrals uh, that we know, uh, the period of. And that was it's the, the series of zigzag graphs. So uh, I'm, Oliver Schnetz is in the audience, I'm, I'm very happy to see him. Again, so he was, uh, uh, together with Francis Brown, they proved this theorem that all of these zigzag graphs give you some rational number times um, the zeta value. And this is already a very complicated result. You need a lot of machinery and technology to understand these kind of results. Um, and it's only been through the work of, of Oliver um, that these kind of things have become possible. Um, and also, overall, we have now like a couple maybe a bit more than a thousand periods in, in fact of the fourth theory. Um, and I mentioned fact of the fourth theory, you might, because this is a theory, where indeed the, the calculations have been pushed to the highest loop orders. So, so we have complete understanding up to seven loops. And this is also due to, to Oliver. And, but even from a, still from a resurgence point of view, you would think, well, seven coefficients, you know, kind of maybe, I don't know, I wouldn't want to write that paper, right? Um, but anyway, so this is what we have. This is all we have. Um, so how can we get any more information? How can we get any farther? Um, so I want to suggest the following. So this looks very stupid, but I promise you, in the end, maybe it seems like it's not entirely stupid. 
So, so what, what you do is uh, you take this polynomial u, and then instead of adding all of these monomials, you, you take the maximum. So if you ever heard of tropical geometry, you see, okay, maybe, um, but I can explain later. So instead of one plus x2, we have the maximum of one and x2. Um, so you can compute this integral by splitting it into the two parts. When x2 is smaller than one, then you just have dx2. When it's bigger, you have dx over x squared. And you get two. I remember earlier we got one. Now the integral is two. So definitely something changed, which is not surprising. Um, but I hope you can already anticipate that this integral is much easier to compute. And there's a couple of uh, observations um, to be made that are quite interesting, actually. So the first one is, why is this called the hep bound? Well, because this is an obvious bound. But right? if you take the, the if you change the, the sum to the maximum, you're making the denominator smaller, the integral gets bigger. And also because every sum end is smaller than the maximum, there's a bound in the other direction if you also count the number of terms. So this, this hep thing, it, it really sandwiches the actual integral from, the, from above and below. Uh, and this, this was used originally to, to prove the renormalizability theorem, so the power counting. Right? You just take a spanning tree and they look what is the power counting when these variables go small. I mean, this is for the, the HEP sectors, um, what they are, and this is where they come from. This is why I called it that. But it also tells you that the asymptotics are the same, right? So if you have something that grows factorially, now the only thing you're bounding it below and above by something um, that only is, is away from a factor that is the number of spanning trees. The number of spanning trees is at most two to the number of edges because every edge is in the spanning tree or it's not. So you're only losing an exponential factor, but you cannot uh, change the factorial growth. Factorial growth is still there. Uh, the second observation is that this is a rational number. Just divide it up in all the sectors to, according to what the variables are ordered. It's just a little simple monomial integral. So there's always a rational number. And in principle, you can compute them for all graphs. So that, of course, in practice, there's always some computational limits. Um, but there are efficient formulas, so you can compute these for graphs with very high loop orders. And by very high, I mean here, things like 18, 19, 20. Um, and I think that's maybe a reason, a region where you can say, okay, now we can really look at the series and try to learn something from it. The more surprising uh, properties uh, are the ones that I wanna talk about. And the rest of the talk, I just wanna mention, um, I mean, only actually two of these, um, the correlation. So as I said, mentioned earlier, this is interesting in part because it, even though this is a very different number now assigned to the graph, okay, it has the same asymptotic growth, but I will illustrate actually that numerically it's very closely related. So there's even a way how you can use this to get at least um, a first rough handle on what the actual uh, Feynman integrals are. And the second thing I want to mention is something about symmetries, which suggests that this construction is not only good for numerics, but it really hints at that there's an intrinsic meaning in this theory. It has a lot of properties um, that a random approximation wouldn't have, which ultimately is a consequence of the fact that this is really a, a limit. You take a certain deformation of the Feynman integral, the tropical limit of it will be this thing. So this inherits all the symmetries of the actual Feynman integral. And I will illustrate that. And as I said earlier, this generalizes to functions of masses and momenta. But again, I will not uh, do this example in this talk. Okay. So this is just uh, one illustration uh, of the computation. I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but if there's any combinatorialist in the audience, they might uh, be happy to see this. So the Feynman integral, right, which was an integral, if you sum it up over these different sectors, you can turn it into something uh, combinatorial. So what you're doing here is this, this is a formula for, for this bound in terms of a bridgeless or one, one particle irreducible subgraph chains. So, so think of this three loop graph you looked at earlier. And then I start with a one loop graph, a bridgeless one loop graph. So that's, that's a triangle or a square. And then I, I can add some edges to, to get a two loop graph. Um, and I can do it basically only these two ways. And in this particular case, the, the only bridge of this one PI one loop graph is either triangle or square in this particular graph. So you only have these two possibilities and then you can do 
do a little calculation. So for every of these graphs, you get a little factor. You count the number of edges. You have three edges here to begin with, and you add two more edges. So this is the three times two times one. And in the denominator, you count the, the power counting. So this is uh, three edges minus two because it has one loop. So this is a um, graph of degree of uh, convergence one, and this one as well. So this is the one in the denominator here because you start with a square. You have four edges, and a one loop graph with four edges is quadratically convergent in four dimensions. Uh, so this is why there is a two here. And as I said earlier, there is a, you have to count. So there's a, four of these triangles, and then you have to count how many ways are there to put this triangle into one of these graphs. You get some factors, there's 12 of those and six of those. And if you add everything up, you get 48. So this is not important. What is all I want to bring across is that you can compute these things um, and they get much bigger. So if you go back, I, I may have mentioned that the actual integral of this is uh, six zeta of three, which is something like seven point, seven point something, maybe 7.6, I don't know. Somewhere between seven and eight. Um, and this is much bigger, right? It's an upper bound. And it's quite a lot bigger. Right? It's more than a factor of 10. So let's, let's compute some more. So this is a table. That, the notation on the left is taken from Oliver Schnetz's paper, which is called the census. So there's a, it's like a census. You know, you can look up a graph, and then it tells you what, what is known about the graph. And up to seven loops, the census is complete. So up to seven loops, in fact, to the fourth loop, we know all these time and periods. Um, the, the exact expressions are way too long. So what I've drawn here in this, this column is just some numerical approximation. But all the digits you see are exact, and we do know the exact results. But they, t they can, in some cases, they're very complicated expressions in terms of polylogarithms. So you wouldn't really like to see them. Um, and in the other column, I've drawn um, the, the hat bounds. I told you they're rational numbers in this case. Okay, they turn out to be integers, but that's just um, coincidence. And I've arranged them in the way that I ordered them according to the magnitude. So I ordered them by the periods, um, bigger to smaller. Um, and you see that the, it, it goes along, right? When, when the actual integral is bigger, the bound is also bigger. When you see it's, it's way bigger, right? Now we have like two orders of magnitude already between the bound and the number. Um, and then you draw a graph and you get this. Um, so you find that so on, the, on the horizontal axis, you see the set bound, which is, as I said, two orders of magnitude bigger. And on the vertical axis, you see the actual Feynman integral. But if you rescale it, um, they, they lie on this plot. I mean, this, this red dashed line is just some power law interpolation that has no real meaning. But what I wanted to show here is that it's actually, but you could imagine, I suppose you wouldn't have known what that integral is, but you can compute the hat bound. But then you get at least the 1% accuracy approximation from this plot. So this, this allows us to get some understanding of what happens at larger loop orders, because we can compute these hat bounds. And as long as we have at least a couple of periods to, to gauge this plot, you know, we get, it, get at least the feeling of, or maybe even a 1% approximation of the corresponding coefficient um, of these contributions to the beta function. I should say that actually there is a way to, to align this over loop orders. So actually there's a, there's a diagram where you can put all the graphs of all loop orders in one diagram and all as a similar um, correlation. But this is what I meant at the very beginning, that in this tropical theory, even though you get a different scale, but up to a rescaling of everything, changing the coupling constant, um, the, the integrals are really very well reflected. So you may be computing in a different theory, but actually it's, it feels like it's very close to the actual uh, theory. Um, and I want to highlight uh, a work by Michael Borinsky, uh, who is also uh, here, so you should talk to him. Um, and, and he figured out that actually you can use this uh, tropical approach, not just get this rough guess via this plot, but you can actually use a, turn it into a consistent approximation scheme uh, and, and make, uh, make an algorithm that samples a Feynman integral um, using this tropical um, um, separation of the integration domain. And this allows us to get uh, higher precision numerical results for the actual time interval. So you can get like uh, six digits numerical accuracy for an 18 loop order Feynman interval, which before that was completely uh, out, of, out of the realm of possibilities. 
we really do have tools now to, to get some large order um, results, at least numerically and study the, the asymptotic behavior. Um, I should also say this, this generalizes also this tropical syndrome of, of Michael Borinsky. This also generalizes to integrals with uh, kinematic dependence. So, so much about that. And then in the, in the second half, I just wanted to mention um, this other special property. So I, I explained that, okay, there's this tropical approximation, which at first is just an ad hoc way to get some estimates and prove some convergence maybe, but then we, we find this correlation. So it's actually useful to, to compute integrals. But as I hinted on the, in the background, this is really a limit. This is a special value in a way of the actual Feynman interval in a certain sense. Um, so it has structural properties that reflect the same symmetries of Feynman intervals. So you can start with a very simple question. You take two graphs and you ask, when is their Feynman interval the same? Very simple question, very hard to answer. So, so let's look at this, this question. What are relations that we know that relate different graphs that have the same Feynman interval? So there's a couple of relations uh, which, which you might expect. So th this product rule, if, if you know Feynman integrals in momentum space, this is um, something you would, uh, I don't know, drink with your morning milk or I don't know. So if you have a subgraph that is connected to the rest of the graph only through two vertices, it integrates out somehow, it factorizes. And you can depict it uh, in this particular way. So you have these two vertices, you have a cut of the graph at two vertices, and then you can cut it into its pieces and maybe add some edges between these special vertices, and then you have a product relation. In this case, on the graph on the left, if you now use these two vertices to cut it, uh, with a bit of imagination, if you cut away the right half and you add an edge, then the left half is again a complete graph on four vertices. So it's not drawn exactly the same way, but I hope you can uh, fill this in in your mind. So the, the, the Feynman integral of this graph is the square of the Feynman integral of that graph. And, and that I, I showed you earlier was a 6, 8, or 3, so we get a 36, 8, or 3 squared. So this is not really a relation about when two integrals are the same, but it tells us something, okay, when is something a product of other things you already know. Now relation more of the type is, is what you would expect as planar dualities. If you have a graph, you draw its planar dual. Um, then the Feynman integral is the same. In this case, it's a bad example because the dual is isomorphic to the original graph. But the first example where something interesting happens is a bit too uh, convoluted, so I, I chose this one. So there are examples where the planar dual is not isomorphic to the same graph, and you actually do get a relation. And then there's a couple more interesting ones. So the, the one on the top is completion called completion, this is also due to Oliver Schnetz. Uh, and it is basically a consequence of conformal invariance. Um, and here the idea is if you have a graph that is conformal, i.e. four regular in four dimensions, uh, if you delete any one vertex, you, the remaining integrals will have the same time and integral. So let's, let's start with the graph on the, here in the middle. So you have three independent vertices, and then you add an edge on the right connected to everything in the middle and you add an edge on the left connected to everything in the middle. So you see there's two equivalence classes of vertices. Some of the vertices in the middle are special, and then the vertices, uh, the other four are somehow play a different role. If you delete one of these ones, the V here, then you easily see, right, you pull this one down a little bit, you get the thing on the left. And if you delete the one in the middle, now you actually get the thing we just looked at. You get a relation that this Feynman integral, which is again, a square of another Feynman integral, is the same as the Feynman integral of this non-planar graph. This just tells you that you really get relations between obviously non-isomorphic uh, graphs. Then there is a relation called the twist. This is uh, also Oliver Schnetz's observation, where you now take a cut at four vertices, and then you swap around uh, the, the edges on one side, and you get this twisted thing here. So, um, these, this again can relate, there's actually quite a lot of these relations, so they can really identify two graphs um, that are non-isomorphic and you get relations. Obviously difficult to see this, so you need to use some computers to, to find these relations. 
for big graphs. And then there's a combination of planar duality and this uh, um, sitting at three vertices, which was uh, only pointed out more recently. Um, Oliver and uh, Aaron Yates and Simon, I think. Where the idea is you have like, uh, you look at the subgraph that connects only at three vertices and then you apply planar duality only to the subgraph. So this is now the dual graph, the blue thing. And then you twist it around. So somehow in the planar dual, you have now a vertex that sits between U and V. And this one you attach to where the original V was at. I hope the image kind of explains what's going on. But you also have an identity there. And you can, and this, these are known uh, relations. So for the Feynman integral, you can prove that all of these preserve the Feynman integral. Now the one line of research in this area was to, how, the question was how, how can we learn anything about Feynman integrals if we can't compute the Feynman integrals? Right, because that's too complicated. So the idea was to, to find other things, uh, toy models of Feynman integrals, um, that in a way reflect the same properties of the Feynman integral, but that are actually computable. Um, and for a long time, the only thing we had was what's called the C2 invariant. Again, um, this is Oliver Schnetz's invention. So what you do here is you take this, this polynomial and you look for its solution over a finite field. So you count the, the points of a finite field on the surface. You find out it's divisible by, by P squared. If, if the field is the field of P elements. And then you look at the remainder modulo P. So for every prime, you get this number CP, which is C2, which is itself a number in um, modulo P. Well, and there's quite a lot of work on this has been done. So we know quite a number of things about the C2 invariant. Um, a much more recent um, invariant then was introduced by Ian Crump, which is called the extended graph permanent. This is based on the uh, adjacency matrix of the graph. And you, instead of, you build a square matrix out of the adjacency matrices, and then you take the permanent, not the determinant. Uh, and also there you can, for every prime of a certain type, you can generate a number. So these two invariants have this shape. So you get actually quite a lot of information for every prime, you get some information. So this is a Feynman integral that takes values in functions on the primes. Um, but they are also quite tricky to, to compute. There's quite a lot of work to, to get here, get information here. Um, but this is just an example. I don't want to talk about the specifics, just to give you the intuition. Okay, for every prime you have some number. Um, and now this, this hep, hep thing has the same invariance. So it turns out that all the symmetries that I showed you, they're also reflected by these rational numbers. Um, so in a way you can really think of this tropical limit as a Feynman integral you know, as a toy Feynman integral in its own right, it has the same identities, which in hindsight is, is clear because it's just a special value. So as long as the symmetries hold on, on a regularized level, you get these. Um, and there's two more invariants that I recently found, but they're, I don't wanna to talk too much about them, but they take integer values. Um, so we have now quite a big toolbox of uh, of data that if you take a graph, you can compute quite a lot of things that are not the Feynman integral, <laughs> but that all somehow have something to do with the Feynman integral. Uh, but to make the connection precise is, is very difficult. So many graphs that are actually not the same Feynman integral do have some invariants the same and some invariants not the same. So these invariants are not uh, perfect invariants, um, except maybe for, for the Hepburn. So it turns out that this tropical Feynman integral is very rich. So as maybe if you, Remember the, the previous slide where I had this table, you know, all the head bounds are really different. So there was no case where two graphs just randomly had the same head bound. Um, so in, in some sense, the head bound is rich enough. This tropical Feynman integral is rich enough, at least in this particular theory. There are counterexamples in other theories, but in fact of the fourth theory where the graphs are so rigid, it seems like the tropical um, limit can really tell integrals apart. Uh, and this leads to, to this conjecture, which is maybe wrong, but it's a good guideline to, to think about things, I think. So the idea is that if you have two graphs that have the same tropical Feynman integral, but then either you have bad luck and it's just a coincidence, um, but maybe in, in most cases, um, it's actually telling you that there is something uh, explaining this relationship. And indeed, we, we have examples of this. So this is an example at, 
at eight loops and phi to the four theory. Um, I must apologize for the drawing of the graph on the left. I somehow can't make it nicer. If anybody has an idea, please tell me. It's, it looks ugly. Um, but these are two non-isomorphic graphs. Believe me that. You can check that these are not isomorphic. And they're both valid phi to, phi to the four integrals. They both contribute to the beta function phi to the four at eight loops. Um, we don't know their periods, right? So this, these are so, so complicated. We don't know what the actual time integrals are. We can compute them to a couple of digits, as I explained. Now we have this topical sampling, so we can really get some digits into all the accuracy we can get. They, they, they are compatible, so they could be the same. The hep bounds are the same, and all the other nerves are the same. The C2 nerve is the same, the permanent is the same, the six cuts is the same, the symmetry factor is the same, it's all the same. But either we're very, very, very unlucky, or there is actually an underlying symmetry between these five intervals that we just haven't understood yet. I would be willing to bet several bottles of good wine um, that there is a, a new symmetry of Feynman integrals that has deluded us so far. And if anybody has an idea, that would be very welcome. But to, 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 to come to a close for my talk, what, I, what my idea here was really just to, to, to give you uh, indications that this very stupid looking thing of taking this tropical limit of a Feynman integral is maybe not so stupid in the end. So it, it leads you to, to maybe detect some, some new relations. It has same asymptotic behavior. It can give you numerical approximations. So I think it's a worthwhile object to study in more detail. And there's, there's a lot to be done. I mean, you can really take, um, def define a tropical phi to the four three, you know, with masses and momenta and, and study that and try to learn something about resummation and critical exponents in this tropical model. I mean, this is, I think, would be a, a very worthwhile exercise. And then, of course, you can wonder how this can maybe ge be generalized uh, to other theories. But I should uh, finish here, I think. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and comment on Eric's talk. Thank you very much. It's really a major great thing to be back on a physical audience. And uh, I didn't really know exactly what Eric was talking about because when I asked him for his slides, he said his work was still under construction and he had to derive some theorems. But in the end, I just want to step back a little bit further and uh, make some general remarks on the kind of grid theory very much in the sense what uh, Eric was already talking about. So uh, the first thing I want to do is some general remarks remarks on perturbative quantum field theory. Uh, the first thing that strikes you when you look at these uh, perturbative quantum field theory calculations is how difficult they are. Eric already said this, very difficult. I have somehow the impression that's probably the most difficult physical theory that we know, but maybe that's just a personal uh, perception. And in this conference, there was, for example, even the definition is not so easy. And in this conference, this Epstein Glass approach is sort of prominent, which is a mathematically very nice uh, method to actually define these things. But uh, if you're a physicist, then you may be uh, allowed to take a practical approach to these things to think how can I actually do calculations. And as far as I know, is Epstein glass is still not yet uh, developed enough to do these yeah, even low order or a medium order uh, calculations uh, that we would like to do as a physicist. And there is something that we use, which is called DIMREC, dimensional regularization, where you do something like in four minus epsilon dimensions which looks very ugly when you see it for the first time as a mathematician, definitely, even as a physicist, it looks very weird. But uh, the longer you think about it or the longer you use it, the more striking it is how practical it is. So you actually can do calculations. For some reason, I don't think anybody knows, it works pretty well to do actual calculations. And then there's another benefit, so you can do calculations 
And then there's another very practical thing about uh, DIMREG is that you can do two theories in one theory, so to say. You can bridge from four dimensions down to three dimensions, from quantum field theory down to statistical physics, like we had in the first talk, and actually make predictions on critical exponents in some statistical models by universality. So if you're a practical person, then it's, uh, then it's DIMREG is an amazingly practical thing to use. Exponents. So you do basically two different things in one go, which is which is very nice if you're a practical person. But still, things are very complicated. So it doesn't really solve the problem. This is only you use this only if you if you have grasped the subdivergences. We didn't have this in the talk by Eric. We had this for the for the HEP invariant, but many examples were just primitive graphs where the mathematics is uh, at least from this infinities business, randomization business is, is trivial, but the calculations still are very, very complicated, of course. And then there is uh, another remark that I want to make about this difficulty of quantum field theory is, this is a practical physicist approach, but when you're a mathematician, then there are sorts of two sorts of difficulties. There's this annoying difficulty that things are just difficulty and that's it. And there's Another sort of difficulty, which is a nice difficulty because it has lots of complicated and interesting mathematical structure. So uh, there's lots of mathematical structure. Structure. And it's hard to appreciate how much mathematical structure perturbative quantum field theory has. So you are very much in the regime of nice difficulty. We don't really understand this now, but there's so much to find out. There's this co-action, the Galois, the, the Galois co-action. And there is the whole number theory, number contents, seed of three is only first thing that you see. You see lots of nice numbers. So there's number contents. It's very interesting, the, the periods, mathematical periods. Uh, and then you have the C2 invariant that, uh, that Eric already mentioned. And this gives us a glimpse to high loop orders, the, the geometry that underlies these numbers in, in, in high loop orders. In mathematics, in physics, you have a number and the number is a number and that's it. Yeah. But in mathematics, if you're in the right branch in mathematics and algebraic geometry, then a number is not just a number. A number is, has a geometry and there's so much more uh, to find out about these numbers than it's, it's, it's mere digits. And this is really very interesting. And you have this modular forms and Calabi-Yaus and whatever you want. And there's so much mathematical structure behind perturbative quantum field theory that at some stage you really have to admit that you don't know actually how complicated perturbative quantum field theory is. Because it can happen that it looks very complicated, but that's only true because you don't understand the mathematics well enough. It could be feasible, feasible that uh, the actual perturbative quantum field theory is much better behaved than we would expect nicely. So if it's allowed uh, for a discussion to mindly contradict the speaker, it's not clear, it may be, but it's not clear that uh, a perturbative quantum field theory is inf infinitely difficult. There could be, that's, that's from the C2 invariant, it, there seems to be some, some limitation to the difficulty underlying perturbative quantum field theory, which we don't understand yet, but that's just completely open and a very philosophical. Er Eric, remark. do you have a comment to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, that's the very general picture. And now we uh, stop doing this philosophical remarks and turn to uh, practical results. Because here the talk becomes really very interesting. And the first thing that we have, which is not so much to do with the talk, we have this uh, low loop order results. Loop orders. We have seven loops uh, in, in five to the four. I just 
to be specific, uh, when you talk about phi to the four, we have seven loops beta function. And if you, if you don't know what a beta function is, then it's just uh, an interesting function in, in uh, quantum field theory, which links to this critical ex exponents. And you have an eight loops result for the gamma function. And uh, this is not very high, but at least it's something. Uh, the tool to get these results would be the graphical functions method. I think that's for now the only way to get seven loops and beyond seven loops. And then we have asymptotics. Uh, Eric also talked about asymptotics uh, from, I think it's instant. I'm not an expert in this, so I don't really know this very well comes from instantons, maybe a name to drop here is McCain. I don't know how reliable they are. I don't think they're mathematical theorems, but I think they're sort of reliable, this information. And now we have something very new. And this is what Eric talked about. We have an intermediate, we have intermediate results. From the HEP. The hap. And then plus uh, Michi Orinsky. So I, I, she didn't talk, but I, I can't, I have to mention his name. I may should write it down in the full name. Because we saw from Eric's talk that the, the head bound gives a good approximation. As Eric said, uh, Michi Burinsky developed, uh, uh, developed uh, just uh, put it a bit further and made a real approximation where we, if, you, if you work harder, you get more and more digits of, of the individual graphs. And this works exactly in the intermediate regime. So it goes past seven, eight loops but it's, uh, there's a long gap between the seven, eight loops and the asymptotics as you, as you see when you, when you look at this seven, eight loops and then you have the asymptotic result and it doesn't really match. And now we have this intermediate results and uh, it's just, they, they just come nicely together all these results uh, by Eric and by Michael. And uh, this, this is just something like a missing link. But this is a very, very important, and nobody would have guessed this a few years ago that something like this could even exist. It was beyond fantasy some years ago. But now we have this extra information that we, we didn't hope for. And, and uh, all of a sudden it's uh, there and we can, can use it and we can, see, we can see what we can do with it. And it's not a problem that they work best for primitive graphs where you have no subdivergencies. First of all, you think, okay, we again restrict ourselves to only a subclass of graphs, which we had before over and over again, uh, like in this, uh, yeah, like what, what Eric said about this, this restrictions looking only at, at, at certain, certain subclasses of graphs. But the situation is very different here because in this intermediate regime, we know by experiment and, and morally, we know that the, these, uh, these subclass of, of graphs are actually very, very dominant. So we really expect that almost 100% of the numerical value is carried by exactly the graphs that the HAP can see most easily and Michi Borinsky's uh, numerical approach uh, works best with. So it, many things come very luckily together. And uh, so if we, we put everything together, then, then we are, uh, that's the amazing thing. We are, we are not solving like uh, normally when you work in, in, in mathematics and physics, you just solve a small gap in an existing, for an existing question. But here we open up a completely new field in physics. We get a completely new direction of research, which we couldn't do before. So there's something really new coming up. And the, the, we, we were able to, to, to corner the, the perturbative uh, quantum field theory 
Now, from, th from, from three signs, slow loop orders, medium intermediate loop orders, and asymptotics. So we could dare to ask if we kind of get a complete understanding, approximately at least, of all loop orders, if we put all the things that we know together. Huh? So we get an all loop order approximations. Maybe it's a bit early to ask for very precise results in this direction, but at least you know there is this new this new area is open now. So we can study, we can try to make research in this direction. And if we have an all loop hour order approximation in perturbative quantum field theory, then you could, we could hope be able to extract non-perturbative. information from perturbative quantum field theory. And it's, of course, it's only non-perturbative in one sense. You know, there are things like incidents that you never see in any order of the loop or uh, in the perturbative uh, expansion. But there are non-perturbative things that you see when you have an idea how all orders behave which you would not see if you only have seven orders or five orders or even 10 orders, you know? So you get something. And even these instanton things that you don't see at, at, at any order, there is still the hope to get information from, from all orders uh, in the perturbation field if you use this resurgence, which is also very new sort of. So even like instantons and these things are com not completely detached like when you build up a random function. So there is an, an, a link between these all order results and even completely non-perturbative results. And if you put everything together that we have, then you could really start this new direction and, and, and ask what, if you put everything together that we know about perturbative quantum field theory, can we make some very new predictions? Can we get a completely new, deeper understanding of, of, of quantum field theory for the first time ever, because there's no four-dimensional quantum field theory. We can hope for a solution, a complete solution like that, uh, not at least something that is vaguely physical. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. And now I wanted to start with a few questions because I thought maybe because I'm a discussant, we want to discuss a bit. And I would write down a few questions. Uh, maybe you, you have some more questions, if, if that's okay. So yeah, I think we can start with your questions and then I will open the discussion yes. for the audience. So yeah. I, I just started with four questions. I already, already indicated uh, the questions with what I said before. Uh, one question is, is how can I use, I use the intermediate results results for better resummation. We know that we have an asymptotic series. We know that we have to resum the series. There is lots of magic going on and not everything that people do is ad hoc very clear why they do this. And sometimes if you're a very evil mind, you may think that things are sort of a little bit twitched that they work in the end. So maybe we get a higher precision or at least a, a less tricky, tricky or fancy way to understand this resumption. Because uh, if you have an asymptotic series, then the regime of somewhere 10 to 20 loops orders is very, very helpful. Actually, if you do some experiments, you see low order loop orders gives you a bit. A few more loop orders don't give you much more, but if you had 15, 20 loops order, you get an awful lot of more information about these things. Maybe there's sometimes uh, people have the wrong idea about their uh, resummation and, and uh, asymptotic series. Think people think they can only use the first loop orders and then everything else is useless. That's completely wrong. Like you, you really get something out of this intermediate results. Uh, the next obvious question is uh, which quantum field theories can you do? Uh, 
Uh, we talked about five to the four, five to the three, and six dimensions should be okay. Young Mills, I don't know, because this is certainly much trickier for the HEP, uh, I guess. So that's an obvious question. It would be very interesting to have something like QED and a better understanding non positive QED, Landau poles and stuff like that. That would be, maybe it's a bit futuristic. Um, then there's a question, if you think of this numerical things, and if you even think about low loop orders and you want to do eight loops gamma uh, beta function, you could do this, but you, you're left over with a few graphs in the near future, which you can't do actually ex exactly. Then it would be good to have a numerical method that only also works for subdivergent graphs. As you know, this is some question more or less for, for me here. I know that it should be in principle possible. Numerics for subdivergent graphs. I say it again, this would be really helpful for this low loop or to extend this low loop order regime a, bit, a little bit higher. Because then you're not dependent to do everything analytically, then you can have something left over which you can't do analytically, but you're still not lost. You still can do some numerics. And then I want to have a question about this uh, amazing conjecture by Eric. Does it have the official status of a conjecture or is this just an educated guess or a question? Hmm? <laughs> But what's the difference? Uh, the mathematics is a huge difference between conjectures and questions. And so if the, if the half-band is the same, then the period is the same. And as Eric said, uh, that means that we miss an awful lot of identities on the period side. And we know that all the identities we know exist in the period side do also exist in the half side. So my question to Eric is, have you ever tried to derive new identities purely looking at the HEP side and check if you have, maybe because it's a completely different thing, you think about it, ah, I get this fancy new identity on the HEP side, and then I could check what's happening to the period side. So my question is, do you have an equation, new equation? Or G1, G2, because this really is, a, is a, for me, it's a major puzzle. It's amazing that we seem to miss identities, which are so simple, like the two periods are the same. 